Next week, we launch our most popular series of the year at the movies. And so if you've never been here with us for that series, what we do is uh, we, like we have worship and like we normally do, but we'll take different pieces of a movie and we'll kind of teach through that movie, talking about the Bible and how it relates, because that's what Jesus did. He told parables, which were stories to help people see spiritual realities. And so we let the filmmakers tell the stories and we add in the Bible with worship. And of course, you can't watch movies without popcorn and soda. So we have free popcorn and soda at all of our services. And so we did it one time, just like, hey, it's July, summer. Nobody's, yeah, everybody's out of town, vacation. Let's just see this. Let's see if anybody likes it. And it turns out to be the most popular series that we have ever done. People absolutely love it. And my favorite thing about this series is that it is the best time of the year to invite someone to church who doesn't normally go to church. Right, uh, because you know you always try to ask your friends to come to church. Like, oh, I'm not really a church person. Well, that's perfect because whenever they say that to you, you can say, "Well, do you like movies?" Which the answer should be, of course, if you're saying you love movies, right? And so you say, "Yes, well, I do like movies." Well, then you'll love church because we're going to be showing movies. We're going to have popcorn and soda, and it's going to be great. Don't tell them I'm actually going to preach a sermon and all that stuff. Don't talk about the worship. Be like, dude, you'll get to watch a movie in church. It's going to be great. But uh, I promise you, it is going to be an absolutely amazing series, an amazing time, and. So to help you invite people, we have some invite cards to at the movies in the seat pocket in front of you. Uh, I think we have like eight or so in there. Grab as many as you need. We have a ton, but just grab some of those. Think about anybody that comes to your mind, someone that you work with. And I'm telling you, people are wanting to come back to church more than ever before. We have seen a drastic increase in the amount of first-time guests that have been coming to our church. It has blown us away. People are hungry for the reality of God. And you have an opportunity to extend that simple invitation that just might change their life forever. So we hope you invite someone. Don't come alone. Bring somebody with you next week for at the movies. But that's next week. I wish it was this week, but you're stuck with just me talking like a normal time, you know, like a regular service here for this week. How many of you have ever been in a car accident where the airbag went off? Anybody in here? Yeah, it hurts, doesn't it? doesn't feel like it's air in that bag. I think it's poorly named. It should be like cement bag is what it should be called because that's what it feels like when that thing hits you in the face, right? And it moves faster than the human eye can detect, right? So you're just like driving along, you get into an accident, and bam, your face hurts, right? It, it feels like the other driver got out of the car, punched you in the face, and then left you a balloon because he felt bad about it, right? That's, that's what it feels like. Airbag comes out at 220 miles per hour, I hit the car in front of me going 10 miles an hour, right? I would rather ram my face into the steering wheel at 10 miles an hour than to have a 220 mile bag of air pop me in the face. Like what if I'd been eating a taco? That'd have been it for me right there, right? A 220 mile an hour taco is lethal. You know, I was thinking about this, you know, sometimes life feels like getting hit with an airbag, right? You're driving along, everything is great, and all of a sudden, bam, you get hit with something that you didn't see coming, and it hurts. Sometimes life hurts. Has anybody ever wondered why life can be so difficult, especially as Christians, right? I mean, if God is so great and so good, then why is my life so bad right now? Right? How come there's so much turmoil in my family? How come my husband left? How come I'm always sick? How come my kid is on drugs? How come I'm depressed and anxious and I don't have any joy? How come I can't ever seem to get enough money to get ahead? How come I just can't catch a break? These are sincere questions that sincere Christians frequently ask. And I don't have all the answers for you, but I do want to talk today about one of the main sources of the problems, the chaos, and the conflict in our lives, and that's the devil. Now, I know that the devil's kind of out of fashion among Christians. We don't want to talk about him in church anymore. We just want to talk about Jesus, pretend like he doesn't exist, right? But, but it's real. Scripture says that we have a spiritual enemy that is trying to take us out. First Peter 5, 8 says this. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone 
to devour. If I could get the house lights on above me, that'll help me see my notes there. Um, But the Bible says that we have an enemy that is walking around looking for someone to devour. And I believe that it's because of this, because of the devil and his minions that we experience so much hardship, difficulty, and problems in our lives. Now, you think, why does the enemy want to take me out? What have I done to him? Well, I think the enemy wants to take you out for the same reason that the Pharisees and the religious leaders wanted to take out Lazarus. If you read in John chapter 11, Jesus' friend Lazarus was sick, and his sisters Mary and Martha came to Jesus and said, hey, we need you to come and pray for Lazarus because he's sick. And so it says that Jesus waited two more days until Lazarus died, and then he decided to go over and see him. Now, there are a lot of, you know, Christian cliches that church people use, you know, like, let go, let God, right? Whenever God closes a door, he opens a window. Where God guides, he provides. God's will, God's bill, right? But there is one Christian cliche that I've probably heard more than any other cliche, and that is God's never late. He's always, yeah, he's always right on time. Well, tell that to Lazarus. Tell that to Mary and Martha. It's like, yo, man, Lazarus is sick. He's not good, doing good. We need you to hurry up and get there. And he's like, I'll wait two more days before I go. He waited until he died before he even started, made the journey over to where he was. God's never late, though. He's always right on time. Well, if God's always right on time, then his timetable must be different than ours. Kind of like men and women. They have a different timetable. When a man says, I'll be there in five minutes, he means five minutes. When a woman says, I'll be there in five minutes, it don't mean that. It means, it, it means nothing, right? It's, it's, it, it could be five. It could be ten. It's an indefinite amount of time. It just means I'll be there when I get there. Because men and women have, have different time tables. It's Father's Day. I get to joke on you, and you can't get mad at me for it, all right? It's the one day of the year where I can do that. Right, But like we have different timetables, men and women. I think God has a different timetable than we do. You know, I don't think God is as concerned with time as we are. You know, as adults, we're, we're obsessed with time and getting where we need to go on time and all that stuff. But like, have you noticed that like, kids just don't care about time the way we do? Right? You try to teach them the concept, and they just don't get it. Like right now, I'm trying to teach my daughter Zion how to read a clock. And she doesn't understand why she needs to read a clock, you know? And I'm like, well, if you don't know how to read a clock, how are you going to know when to get up for school? Well, mommy will wake me up. Well, what if mommy wasn't here to wake you up? Well, then you would wake me up. Well, what if both of us weren't here to wake you up for school? Well, I wouldn't go to school. All right, well, I mean, okay, if you can't read a clock, how are you going to know when to eat breakfast? I'd get hungry. All right, forget it. I guess, I guess you don't need to do it. It's like, it, it, like nothing else. Like, I can't like, like impress upon her the importance of time. She just does not care about it. And I don't think God cares about time as much as we do either because he knew Lazarus was sick and yet he waited until he died before he decided to go over and see him. Why? Maybe it's because, you know, if Jesus would have healed him before he died, there would have been some skeptics there that have been like, yeah, he's probably going to get better anyways. I don't think he was really that sick to begin with. Plus, we did give him those essential oils, right? (laughs) He was diffusing lavender and frankincense in his room, so I'm sure that he would have gotten better, right, on his own, all right? It's so... Like, they, they would have been able to explain the miracle away, but when somebody is dead for four days and they come back to life, there is no explanation. There is no oil for that, all right? They're like, like there is, the only way you come back from that is when God shows up. And sometimes I think God waits till a situation is humanly impossible before he shows up. And some of you are facing a situation that is humanly impossible. You need to understand that that is exactly the kind of place where God loves to show up. Because when he shows up and he does what only he can do, he's the only one who can get the credit and the only one who can get the glory for it. You can't blame it on anyone or anything other than Jesus. And that is the perfect example of the type of situation where he loves to show up. And that's where Lazarus was at. By the time Jesus arrived, Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days and Jesus shows up, and, and there was a, a, a stone in front of the, the tomb. They buried him above ground in, in these, these kind of cave-looking things. And so Jesus said, roll away the stone. 
And the next verse is my absolute favorite verse in the King James Version of the Bible. It says, but Lord, he stinketh. Come on, stinketh. That's great, right? Y'all need to use that. When when you walk into your middle schooler's room, you need to be like, look, it stinketh in here. You need to clean this place. That is the best word in the King James English. Stinketh. And Jesus is like, look, I don't care if he stinketh. Roll away the stone. And so they rolled the stone away, and Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Now, he had to say Lazarus because if he just said, come forth, all the dead people would have came out. It would have been like a scene from The Walking Dead, and it would have gotten crazy, right? People would have been running in fear. So he was like, look, I just need Lazarus, all right? Just Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out of the tomb after being dead for four days. This is one of the most notable miracles in the Bible. If you have been to church for a while, you have heard this story before, but I wanna focus on what happened after the miracle. The very next thing that happened in the next chapter, John chapter 12, verse nine says this. When all the people heard of Jesus's arrival, they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Then the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too, for it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. Did you catch that? The chief priests wanted to kill Lazarus because people were leaving them. They, they stopped listening to them and they started believing in following Jesus because of Lazarus's testimony. Because Lazarus has been raised from the dead, people were following Jesus. See, I always knew that the religious leaders wanted to kill Jesus, but I didn't realize that they also wanted to kill Lazarus. And the same reason that they wanted to kill Lazarus is the same reason why the enemy wants to take you out. See, I don't know the circumstances of your life before you came to faith in Jesus. Maybe you were a drug addict. Maybe you were promiscuous. Maybe you were dishonest. Maybe you were an alcoholic. Maybe you were in and out of prison. Or maybe you came to faith in Jesus at a young age, and you've just been following Jesus for your entire life. Whatever the case may be, before Jesus, you were dead in your sins. And just like Lazarus, you were dead, but now you're alive. Your life is a living testimony of God's goodness, his faithfulness, and his power. Your life points people to Jesus. Other people are going to believe and follow Jesus because of what God has done in your life, and the enemy hates that. I want to talk about three specific reasons why the enemy wants to take you out. Number one, you have a relationship with God. Do you know of anyone who, when you're at a restaurant, like they order their food, you order your food, and then when the food arrives, they don't want to eat their food, they just want to eat your food, right? Anybody know someone with food envy that has that, that problem there? Yeah, how many of you, you are that person with, with the food envy? There we go, right there, yeah. Now, or, or how about that person, you go out to eat, and it's like, are you going to get in the, oh, I'm not that hungry, and they don't order food, and so you order food because you are hungry, and then the food shows up, and they want to eat your food, and it's like, no, hold up, I thought, you, I thought you weren't hungry, like, well, I'm not hungry enough to have a whole meal, but I just want some of yours. Like, no, no, that's not how this thing works, right? Like, you get your, I got this because I wanted to eat it, not share half of it with you. Well, I found a restaurant that gets it, right? I'm gonna put that on the screen. Here's a restaurant where you can order the, my girlfriend is not hungry. (laughs) And they add extra fries to your entree. You can get some chicken wings, some cheese sticks added to the entree for the, my girlfriend is not that hungry. If you're a restaurant owner in Albany, Georgia, we need this on our menu here. I need to go to a place like this, right? For that, for that person that is always with somebody that has food envy, this is the perfect restaurant. I see, the enemy doesn't have food envy, but he is envious of your relationship with God. He wants to take you out for the simple reason that you have a relationship with Jesus. He hates the fact that you're a Christian and that you're going to spend eternity with God. He hates that you've been redeemed. He hates that you don't belong to his kingdom any longer. You have to understand that the moment you came to faith in Jesus, there was a target that was placed on the back by the enemy. He wants to take you out for the simple reason that you belong to God. God. So you have to understand that before Jesus, right, you were on the same team. Y'all were walking in the same direction. And now that you put your faith in Jesus, you've switched teams. You're now walking in the opposite direction. So it's only natural for you to bump into him every now and then. Look, if you don't bump into the devil every now and then, it's because y'all are walking in the same direction. (laughs) 
Okay, I'll move on real quick from that. Like, I came back from vacation, right? Angry, just coming at me. All right. No, it, it's, it's true. Like, like you are now working against him and his purposes. And so you're going to bump into him. He's going to cause conflict to try to minimize any damage that you could possibly do to his kingdom. And the main way he tries to do this is by disrupting your relationship with Jesus. He continually tries to get in between you and Jesus. He tries to prevent you from spending time with Jesus. And there are a lot of different, you know, ways that he does this. You know, there, uh, you know, he'll try to lure you into temptation. And then as soon as you give into that temptation, he heaps guilt, shame, and condemnation on you so that you don't feel worthy enough to be in God's presence. You don't feel like deserve to ask him for anything in prayer. You don't want to go to church because you just already feel so bad about yourself. You feel like if I go there, it's going to make me feel even worse. And so you, you distance yourself from God because he knows that nothing will ever separate you from God's love, but you can separate yourself from his active presence in our lives. And so he tempts us to sin and then condemns us when we do. And if he can't get you to give into temptation, then he'll just try to make you busy. If the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy, right? Like he'll try to just keep you overwhelmed, stressed out, and anxious to where you don't have time to spend in Jesus. You don't have time to, to go to church anymore. You don't have time to do small crew because you're so busy with all these other things. In Matthew chapter 13, it, it tells a story about, Jesus tells a story about a farmer who went out and sowed seed into his field, and some seed fell among the thorns. It says that the thorns, they, they, they choked out the seed and kept it from becoming fruitful. And then Jesus explained the parable in Matthew 22. It says, now he, the soil who received the seed among the thorns, is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. So the cares of this world is just another way of saying the busyness of life. See, it's not always bad things that get in the way of our relationship with Jesus. Sometimes it's good things. And good things become bad things when they crowd out the ultimate things. Good things become idols when they take the place of the most important thing in our life, which is why if the devil can't make you bad, he's okay with making you busy. And if he can't make you bad or busy, then he'll just make you bitter. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I don't know where that came from. It's not in my notes, but it's, it sounded good because they all started with the same letter, so it's got to be true, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 2 says this, anyone you forgive, I also forgive, and what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. See, Satan's schemes are to try and pull you into offense, to pull you into bitterness, unforgiveness, and resentment. And notice, Paul said, I forgive so that Satan does not have an advantage over us, which means when you hold on to anger, resentment, and bitterness, Satan has the advantage over you. That is reason enough to forgive right there because when you refuse to forgive, you are an easy prey for the enemy. He will devour you. All right, so the enemy is after, though, your devotion to Jesus. He does these things to try and disrupt the intimacy that you have with God. Number two, the second reason why he's after you is because you have a testimony. See, after Lazarus was raised from the dead, what do you think he was talking to everybody about? The fact that he was dead for four days and now he's alive, right? I'm sure it was everywhere he went, right? It was like, hey, man, heard you were dead. Yeah, man, I was crazy. Like, I was gone and then I came back. It's wild. You know, he was talking to everybody about it. And, and so many people were turning to Jesus, were believing in Jesus because of Lazarus's story. And so the religious leaders were like, look, as long as this guy is alive, he is a thorn in our side. We have to take this guy out because he was a walking billboard for Jesus. Everywhere he went, he was pointing people to Jesus. And you are the same way. Your life is a testimony of God's goodness. 2 Corinthians 3, 2 says this, you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. In other words, you are the only Bible that some people are going to read. Your life is going to point people to Jesus. You know, years ago, I was in San Diego on the beach, and I noticed that on the beach, they have a tsunami evacuation route. And so it's kind of, you know, tells which people, which, you know, way they're supposed to run in case of a tsunami. If you haven't seen one, here's a picture of one that I have right here. That's the tsunami evacuation route on the beach. That's the San Diego tax dollars hard at work for the people. 
Look, I know there are a lot of tourists in San Diego, but if you see a wave the size of a skyscraper coming at you and you don't know which direction to run, society is not going to miss you. We do not need you voting or filling out any kind of census, all right? Like, when you see a wall of water coming at you, like, all right, dude, stop, drop, and roll. What, what, was, it? what was that thing again? Like, 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 if you need that sign, like, we, we don't need you, all right? <laughs> see, but, but, but signs, the reason why those exist, because for even people that don't understand, you're just running the opposite way. Signs are meant to point people in the right direction. And your life is a sign that is supposed to point people to Jesus. Your life is a living testimony of God's goodness, his faithfulness, his love. Your life is a testimony of the saving, redeeming, healing power of Jesus. And, and, and other people are going to come to Jesus because of your testimony, because of what Jesus has done in your life. And the enemy hates that. He does not want you talking about God's goodness. He does not want you posting and sharing about the things that Jesus is doing in your life life it's not just about your testimony when you got saved it's about what he's continuing to do in your life it's about his continued faithfulness and goodness in your life he does not want you talking about those things so he tries to overwhelm you with with, with chaos and stress and problems so that you start focusing on all the things God hasn't done all the things that aren't perfect in your life and so that you stop talking about the goodness of God all right and number three last one this is because you have a purpose the third reason he wants to take you is because you have a God-given purpose, and he does not want you to fulfill it. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You were created on purpose for a purpose. You were created for good works. As long as you have breath in your lungs, you have a purpose. And to a certain degree, the enemy knows what that purpose is. And so he wants to try and redirect you from that purpose. He, he's constantly working in your life to try and derail you from your destiny. Because if he can't take your soul, he will settle for taking your destiny and destroying the purpose that God has for your life. And so he'll do that by trying to come between you and your spouse. He'll try to keep you sick and in pain to where you cannot physically do what God has called you to do. He'll try to keep you financially broke so that you don't have the freedom to do what God has called you to do. He'll try to discourage you so that you lose sight of your destiny. He'll lie to you and tell you that it's too late for you to do what God has called you to do. You, you've messed up too much. You've avoided the call of God for too long, and it's too late now. But it is never too late for you to pursue God's purpose for your life. Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says this, and when God chooses someone and graciously imparts gifts to him, they are never rescinded. That means when God chooses someone, when God says, all right, this is the plan, the purpose that I have for you life and I, for your life, and I'm going to give you these gifts to help you accomplish that purpose, God never changes his mind. He never takes that purpose back. He never says, you're not using those gifts for the right thing. I'm going to take them away. No, he never rescinds his call on your life. God's plan and purpose for your life have not changed. So don't let the enemy think that you've missed your boat and that it's too late to be used by God. So now that we know that we have a spiritual enemy who is, is working to destroy us, how do we experience victory? All right, I got three points for you today. Number one, real quick here. Not going to be long. Dog. Three more. It took a long time to get the first three. These are going to be real quick. Okay. All right, number one, recognize that you're in a spiritual battle. See, too many times we get caught up in the things we can see, hear, feel, and touch, and we are oblivious to the fact that there is an unseen realm. And in that unseen realm, there is a battle that is raging, and that battle manifests in the natural world that we live in. You, you need to view the things that happen to you in life through the lens of this spiritual battle. You need to understand that the problems, the temptations, the conflict, the issues that you are struggling with are not random. They have the root cause in this unseen realm. You have to understand that we live in a war zone and that you have a spiritual enemy. Having a spiritual enemy means that you can't just coast through life. Because as we read earlier, there are demonic beings who that word says they have schemes, which are strategically designed plans to take you down and destroy God's purpose for your life. 
That means you have to be intentional about walking with Jesus. If you're not intentional about walking with Jesus and pursuing the plan and purpose that God has for your life, it will not happen because there are beings that are actively working against you. There is a spiritual gravity in this world that is constantly trying to pull us down, that's trying to pull us in the wrong direction. Because this world is a war zone, it means there is no neutral ground. Either you are moving forward in your relationship with God or you are moving backwards. Number two, avoid unhealthy extremes. C.S. Lewis said this, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. So in the same way that there are people who are completely oblivious to the spiritual realm, there are other people who have an unhealthy obsession with the demonic, right? Everything is the devil this and the devil that, right? They take this thing way too far, right? They blame every flat tire on the devil, every burnt steak on the grill demon, right? Like that person who shows up late for work every day, has a terrible attitude and doesn't do their job and then get fired and it's like the devil did it. Like, no, you're a terrible person. You're with a bad attitude and you're never at work on time. That's why you got fired. Don't try to blame that on the devil. He's like, no, no, that wasn't me. I, don't, I, I take no credit for that. That was all you, right? So, so we don't want to be ignorant or unaware that we're in a spiritual battle, but at the same time, our focus doesn't need to be on the devil. Our focus needs to be on Jesus. And then lastly, Number three, walk in love and obedience to God's word. The key to experiencing victory is to walk in love because when you walk in love, the enemy cannot get a foothold into your life. When he comes to stir up division and strife and you walk in love, it closes the door. When he tempts you to gossip and slander and talk about that other person, you walk in love, it closes the door. When he tries to pull you into unforgiveness, into holding on to that offense, even if that fence is legitimately, it's justified what they did to you was wrong, if he can pull you into that, he can get an advantage over you. But when you choose to forgive it closes the door so we walk in love and we walk in obedience to God's word you have to understand that that when God gives us a, a command in scripture he's not just telling us how to be nice Christians he's telling us how to experience victory over the powers of darkness every scripture that talks about conduct morality and behavior is also a verse on spiritual warfare He's saying, this is my prescription for victory. You don't win by yelling at demons and doing all this weird stuff in the name of spiritual warfare. No, you walk in love and in obedience to my word. James 4, 7 says this, therefore, submit to God. How do we submit to God? By submitting to his word. We submit to God by submitting to the word of God. And so he said, submit to God, resist the devil. How? By walking in love towards people and he will flee from that's how we experience victory. If you guys would please bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I would like to invite you to become a target of the enemy. I'd like to invite you to, to welcome into your life, all right, everything that the enemy has thrown at you. Because let me tell you this, when you become, you turn and you give your life to Jesus, yes, it puts a target on your back. Yes, there is conflict and opposition, but the greatest thing about it is that we have a peace that passes understanding, a joy unspeakable, and a power to overcome everything the enemy throws at us. Jesus said, in this world, you will have have tribulation, trouble, hardship, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you can overcome the world. See, before you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you don't have any power or authority over the enemy, but he gives you power over all the power of the enemy. He gives you authority over the powers of darkness to where you can overcome everything that this world throws at you. And that happens by putting your faith and trust in Jesus, believing that he is the son of God, that he died on a cross for for our sins, that he was buried and three days later he rose again. So that by believing in him, you could be forgiven. You can have a relationship with God here and now and experience the hope of heaven in the future. So if you're here today and you're ready to make that decision, I just want to pray for you right where you're at in your seat. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. If you're here and you want me to pray for you because today you want to surrender your life to Jesus, just lift your hand in the air, in the air right where you're at. Just lift your hand up. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. You can put it right back down. God, I pray for those who lifted their hand in this moment, who are acknowledging you as their Lord 
and Savior. God, I thank you for your power that is at work within them right now, that you are healing, restoring, and making them new. God, I pray that they would experience your love, your goodness, and your power, that they would testify, God, of the work that you are doing and are going to continue to do in their life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we put our hands together for those who made decisions to follow Jesus? We are so excited for you. And that decision that you made, uh, we would love for you to stop by our welcome tent. Where is our welcome tent right now? It's right at the desk. At which desk? That the, the welcome desk. All right. So right out here on your way out by the door, just grab one of those on your way out to help you get started in this journey. If you guys would please stand to your feet. I want to pray over you. Be dismissed. And, and one more time, can we just give it up for all the dads who are here today in church? I'm tell you, statistics across America in church talk about how there's just an absence of men in church, that, that the church is predominantly uh, women, that some churches are, are uh, uh, 70 to 80% women, only, only you know 30 to 20% men. I'm so thankful that that is not the case here, that on your one day where you get to pull your dad card, you get to do whatever you want to do, you decided to come to the house of God. You decided to put God first, and we honor that. We thank you for the godly men in this church and in this community. This this place, this city is better because of you. So thank you. We love you. We honor you. Let's pray. God, I pray today, God, right now for any person, God, who is experiencing, God, warfare, an unusual season of warfare, difficulty, and hardship. God, I pray that we would have eyes to see the source of our problems. That as your word says that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against spiritual forces of evil, that people are not our problem. The, the, the devil and his minions are our problem. And so we set our side on our problem. We thank you that you have given us authority in Jesus' name. I speak to every storm that is raging in the hearts and lives of people, God, and we speak peace to it in Jesus' name. For every person who feels just a heaviness, who feels like their joy has been taken from them, God, we speak joy. We speak life. We speak health over them in Jesus' name. God, we release your blessing over your people today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for being being here. Have a fantastic Father's Day. We love you. Don't forget to grab those uh, invite cards for At The Movies, and we'll see you guys next week. <laughs>